Dr. Proctor um, is a vice president from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and director of Achieving Health Equity Portfolio and the Senior Advisor to the President of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and I've just learned yesterday that he actually is originally um, hails from Washington, D.C., which does also share a number of the issues that we have um, here. And he spent some time overseas as well, um, which I think he talked a little bit yesterday about how that also informs some of his thinking about, about these issues. So thank you. Buenos dias. Assalamu alaikum. Nagadef. All right. I generally don't get an answer to Nagadef. That's all good. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here, Mr. President, and um, to have a summit with your mayor that uh, shows the power of strong partnerships, the impact of leadership to make a difference and change. This is the beginning, as you said, of much more work to come. I couldn't be more proud to be here. So I'm just going to uh, jump right in. Okay, there's your cover slide. Good, everything's fine. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. So what do we know? Boom. I'm guessing that many of you know at some level about the strong links between health, education, and income, and a host of other social factors. So at age 25, a US college graduate can expect to live nine years longer than a 25-year-old without a high school diploma. At age 25, Americans earning more than $100,000 can expect to live more than six years longer than someone with earning less than $35,000. These factors, all of these factors, neighborhood, income, policy, healthcare, lifestyle, education, among others, all impact health. These are often referred to sometimes as the social determinants of health. Um, those social determinants mean that th there are factors that are non-medical in nature that impact people's health in a, every day. And so we know that in our communities, uh, where we work, where we live, how we raise and educate our children are all strongly uh, linked to health. And I've seen this in my own life. Let me go back for a second. This is where I come from. I, I'm from Washington, D.C. That's where I grew up. My family goes back. I calculated it this morning because I wanted to get it straight for everybody. My family goes back. 24 generations in Washington, D.C. Right, and I grew up right here, right there, between the Anacostia River, the orange and the blue lines of the metro, right there. And when I look at this map, I have this map in my office, my family lives all over that place, okay? We've been there so long that there are proctors who don't know they're proctors, okay? <laughs> But notice the difference in life expectancy that $2.50 on a metro can get you if you move over into Virginia, right? Right over here, Fairfax County, 84 years. Over here, Arlington County, 83 years. Well, um, when I was in seventh grade, my mom, she moved us to Fairfax County, where I saw life was different. We had greater access to uh, healthcare. We had grocery stores. In my community in Anacostia, we just got our first grocery store about five or six years ago, because there was this guy named Proctor who started making all this noise about the need to have healthy food access around the country, and all of a sudden we have grocery stores there, where for generations, my family did not have a grocery store. My family did not have easy access to health care. My family did not uh, have the same type of educational system that we saw in um, Virginia that a young person did not have the same opportunity to go out and get a job like we did back in those days back in Virginia. All of those things helped to shape health outcomes for, for not just my family, but many families in the Washington, D.C. area. And then Dr. El Saeed showed um, part of this uh, study from JAMA showing the life expectancy of different cities and so that you can see that where you live starts to make a difference. Some have even gone as far as to say that your zip code matters more than your genetic code in predicting your health in the United States of America. Crazy, right? Absolutely crazy. So, um, but then this map, ha ha ha, y'all haven't seen this one yet. It's gonna be released later this month. Uh, it was put together by researchers at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University with grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but this is your city. This is your area right here. Once again, you can see the life expectancy in different parts of Detroit based on where you live in particular. I see everybody's taking a look, so I'm gonna leave it up there for a little while, okay? Right, so you can see where you live, you can see where your friends and family and neighbors live, and these things, although we're getting this information now, these things could have been predetermined. Here's Detroit again. Long time ago, when the national practice was to redline different areas, to, to um, say where investments should be made 
and where investments should not be made. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 1938, this map right here, okay, that said that certain communities were deserving, certain communities were undeserving, and the undeserving communities were marked in red, and they called that redlining. Didn't just happen here in Michigan, happened all over the country, happened everywhere, where racism, bias, discrimination impacted our public policies. Now, we may not have the same attitudes across the country as what's had at that period of time. These are time, these are conceptual, right? But we can admit that those things did influence the policies. We can admit that those things have impacted our health and the health of others in different places. It's as clear as the map on the wall that certain things could have been predetermined if there was an understanding that health was determined by more than just what happens to you in a doctor's office. Very, very important to think about. And this journey for health equity is not so much that we need to figure out a way to make everything equal, because if so, we call it health equality. And we're not, we're saying health equity, that some people need some things to, to improve themselves, and others may not need those things and may not get those things, and we have to be very, very comfortable with that. So our problems that we're dealing with are structural. Our problems that we're dealing with are things that we can see, things that have been measured, things that can change. And what we do need is the will to change them. We need not only strong leadership, like the leadership that's in this room today, we don't need just intellect, like the intellect that's in this room today. We also need to make certain that we get strong partners, okay, who represent all sectors of society to be fully engaged in this, to understand that regardless of their role, regardless of what their uh, occupation is, or regardless of where they might happen to live on a map like this, that um, what they do, how they behave, who they vote for, okay, all have an impact on the health of generations to come. I enjoyed listening to the mayor speak today, especially about the ground remediation work that's being done and thinking that $2,000 is not too much to pay to make certain that generations of families who live here will be better off because of it. I thought that, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And I love the fact that he's thinking that way and that he relies on science um, to get there. Now, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, what we did was uh, a few years ago, our, our president, our leader, she wishes, she sends her greetings. Her name is Dr. Risa Laviso Mori. Uh, she set up a vision uh, that said that, you know what we need in America? We need a culture of health in America. We have cultures for all sorts of different things. We have our ethnic cultures, we have our religious cultures, we have cultures of consumerism and materialism, political cultures, but we didn't necessarily have a culture of health in America. And the value of a culture of health in America is that if you have that, then the things you do every day, the things you experience all through your life, health is in mind, but you don't have to do health. Health will just be the way that they come. And so this idea, but when you have a vision, then you need to put pen to paper and kind of figure out exactly how are you going to accomplish this vision. So on one of our websites, which is called cultureofhealth.org, okay, there will be um, this action framework is available. That's there. Uh, the, as you can see, equity surrounds this action framework. Equity is embedded in all of the work that we're now doing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's part of my job to ensure that that's the case. Um, but we, what we did though, those four diamonds, I guess you can say there's five if you looked at the uh, middle one for improved uh, health outcome. Uh, those four diamonds are where we're focusing attention because these are the things that we think need to happen in order to have a culture of health in America. So I wanna walk through these things in particular, knowing that I'm only glancing over them that you can go to our website and download the entire document with not just these four diamonds, but the drivers for change that undergird each one of these diamonds and also the, um, the way we're measuring change as we move forward. So first one, making shelf, uh, uh, health a shared value. The three red boxes underneath, and this will continue for the rest of the slides, are the drivers that um, get you there. Making health a shared value. What, health, what making health a shared value looks like is what you're doing here today. You have people from all backgrounds, many backgrounds, many vocations, many, many preoccupations who are thinking about how health uh, comes up in the course of their work. Stimulating this conversation, taking it beyond this room, taking it out into the communities, taking it across the state, and helping to make sh health a shared value will be helpful. The mayor would not have to struggle so hard 
if there was already a culture of health established here, right? He wouldn't have to say, but did you really check? Did you really check to see what was going on in Southwest, right? Southeast, Southwest. <sighs> see, I was paying attention, okay. Um, but making health a shared value, very, very important. And that always has to come back to the work that you do. Fostering cross-sector collaborations to improve health. Every single so uh, sector in society has a role to play in uh, making um, into fostering a cross-sector collaboration. So uh, people in transportation, definitely needed. Media, needed, okay? People in business, needed. The clergy, needed, okay? Academics are needed. Community leaders are needed. Uh, who, architects, needed. Who did I leave out? Who did I, no, it's a real question. Who did I leave out? Teachers, teachers, absolutely needed. Who else? That's right, all of that, all of that. Social workers, got it, two more. Kids, man, these kids today, they will leave us behind, okay? They will leave us behind if we don't include them. One more. Policy makers, and I heard others, and good. But that's the idea. When you start to get together and you start to gather people and start to say, okay, what can we do? Reaching out as broadly as possible is very, very important, absolutely critically important. And, and, and engaging people where they are, not expecting that everybody's going to understand everything the same way, because if so, you would need people from multi-sectors. So that means there's a lot of listening that needs to be done, as well as a lot of sharing, learning, healing, helping, and progress forward. And when, and when touchy subjects come up, like you know, racism, touchy subjects come up and people say, well, I'd rather not talk about racism, but we can talk about race. When touchy subjects like that come up, feel it, wince, but don't be deterred. Don't let it slow you down. Know that it has to come up. This country has a legacy of racism from day one, okay? There was one group against another group, day one, okay? But it's, that was 400 years ago. Today, we can say it and we can acknowledge that it had a role in shaping the way things are now and that there's been hurt and there's been shame and there's been blame and there's been pride. But after we get past that, let's get to joy, let's get to happiness and let's keep going forward with the work. But know that that's gonna be a part of the work going forward. Creating healthier, more equitable communities. Built environment, physical conditions, social and economic environment, Policy and governance, those three things are the drivers of change in, in um, making uh, healthier communities. But what does a healthier community look like, okay? Well, from my past work in childhood obesity prevention, I'm gonna tell you, we have to have access to healthy foods. We have to have safe places to play and exercise and recreate in our own communities. We have to have access to healthcare in a healthier community. We have to have open space so people feel free to congregate, to de decrease the amount of stress that's there. Last night, Dr. Boyle gave a compelling, compelling argument for why traffic calming measures are needed in this city to improve the quality of life in this city and the formidable walls that he challenges by going, uh, going up against the norm of saying, well, no, the yeah, neighborhood road can be at 40 miles per hour. You know somebody's gonna get hit. You know some people are slower than others. You know some people, you, hey, when I was a kid, they used to tell us, wear bright colors at night when you go outside so that you, know, you can be seen. I don't know if that same message is reach, reaching our kids because when I drive around, I'm looking all the time and I see a silhouette of a person. So those traffic calming measures, it's more than just uh, this would be a nice thing to do you will be able to see change immediately in people's lives um, if you focus on health equity in your work and the, equi the equitable notion that people should be able to cross the street in their own communities without fear of vehicular traffic. I have to go back, one more thing that makes a healthier community. Being ready, being ready to welcome home returning citizens, whether they're coming from war or from prisons, Really, really important to do. Can't, we cannot just think that people who have gone through trauma, whether while incarcerated or on the battlefield, can just come back to a community and get, get, jump right back in it. So we have to think, we have to think, we have to think about all of our people who are coming into our communities, especially ones who are coming from new countries who aren't used to our culture and our society. We have to make room for that. We have to make mental space for that. We have to invite them to the table as well. Strengthening the integration of health services and systems. Really, really important. If 80% of our health comes from outside of a doctor's office, outside of a clinician's office, if only 20% is, is actually accommodated by the healthcare system, 
then we have to focus on how do we make the system work better so that the trillions of dollars that we're spending actually have a payoff. Maybe it won't cost us trillions of dollars if we start to figure out where in communities health can be available for people so that they don't have to go to the emergency room for primary care. Okay? So how do we think differently about how the community and the healthcare systems can come together? In Oakland, California, there's a program now working with a, um, that started off in a housing complex, okay? Housing complex for seniors. And realizing that um, seniors need more healthcare, more healthcare more often than others, the uh, resident managers of that, of that complex said, okay, how do I start building relationships with the healthcare system? And how do we um, start to deliver some of the healthcare right here within the complex that we have here so that, when th so that when we do have to go into a medical facility, it's not for, this is an emergency. This is, this is for a, a chronic habit. So how do we think differently about what it means to be in public housing? How do we think differently about how do we deliver care to anyone who needs it? How do we make health a central value for all the work that we do because we know our, our, our country, our communities, will be better off if we think that way? And it's, it's just a matter of thinking that way and pulling people together and doing these things. I make it sound easy. It's not easy. It's hard work. It's very hard work, especially if you're working from the lens of health equity. As I said before, equity is different from equality, okay? And so we have to get used to the distinctions between the two. And, but the distinction is so very, very, very important. Improve population health and well-being. That's the outcome. That's what we want. We want people to be able to live a healthier life if they so choose to do, because they have the opportunities to do so. Because the conditions, as Dr. El Saeed says, it's contextual, right? So that the conditions help to support the health that a community needs. It doesn't mean that everybody starts jogging. It doesn't mean that we all start eating granola every morning like I do. Because <laughs> granola has oatmeal in it, and oatmeal is good for cholesterol, and, I, and berries and yogurts, all sorts of things. But it doesn't mean that everybody has to live that lifestyle. It means that everybody has the opportunity to live the healthiest lifestyle that they want to live. Okay, they have the opportunity to do so, because it's just a part of their environment every single day. So, like I said, it's not easy to do. And there are some things that we've learned at the foundation about um, our own journey, because we weren't set up for this. We were not organized for this. We're 44 years old. Uh, we've been focusing on health, and we've been focusing on health care, almost as if, they, as if they were two different things. One side of the building was health. The other side of the building was health care. Okay? And those of us in health did not understand health care. We did not need to understand health care because we understood health. And those in health care, well, they kind of, I don't understand this public health thing you're talking about. And so we had to sit down, and this was staff driven. What I'm about to show you, and this is what I'm, what I'm going to show you, is um, staff driven. Our board of trustees, I don't believe that they've seen them. I think that they would approve them. But when our staff said that it was very important for us to go on this health equity journey, we said, okay, let's sit down and come up with some principles for the work that we need to do. And this is one example of the principles. And I'm trying to flip through them in my script that you can tell I haven't been using. <laughs> and I got plenty of time, so I can talk for hours. Um, but I want to read to you some of those uh, principles, not so that you can use them, but to let you know that if you're going to start taking this health equity journey, if you're going to start uh, gathering folks around the table and saying, okay, what can we do together? Okay, what can we do together? That everybody is a peer and a partner there. My suggestion would be sit down and come up with some principles. Okay, because like I said, you're going to have some hard conversations. You're going to hear some things. Uh, some grant monies might be focused on, well, I want to do this over here, but the community might say, we need this more. Okay, and if you're good partners with the community and communities are good partners with you, then you need to, um, one, be able to listen, each, um, listen to each other from that standpoint. But having a, set of, um, having a set of principles, wow, I skipped over a lot. No, having a set of principles uh, will help you uh, get by and you work together because at the end of the day, regardless of what feelings come up in those meetings, uh, what progress that you, you decide to make, you can always say, well, let's go back to our principles. And here are a few that the staff came up with at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We got a lot of young people there too, and young people really, they, they, they just don't mince words, they like to get in there. And so, shining a truthful light on society's power structures and biases that have created, fostered, and perpetuated glaring health inequities, number one. Number two, authentically engaging the people directly affected by inequities alongside others. Number three, examining our own roles in perpetuating inequities 
as well as our capacity to help achieve health equity and encourage others to do the same. Fourth, doing more than talk about health equity, we must act through our investments. So there are about seven or eight that staff came up with, but these are the ones that, um, that I, I chose for today because I'm hoping that in this presentation, you see this lived experience um, through the words that I've given you. And this is staff driven, but I, but I encourage you to also create your own set of principles. What does equity look like for your communities here in Detroit? What does equity uh, look like between a university and community partnership that involves other universities, other, other health systems, uh, others all a part of this? What does health equity look like for you? And be vulnerable. Be prepared to be vulnerable and say things like, well, you know what? This is new to me. Um, I'm not quite sure how to relate to you. I don't know, in my experience, you're gonna to have to help me with this. Everybody should be willing to be vulnerable. So I'm gonna tell you a story of vulnerability from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, okay? Um, our president, she's a wonderful, wonderful, bright woman. I respect her so much, she's done so much for me, and that's absolute truth. She joined this group called the Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, along with 39 other presidents of foundations who came together on their own, who said, we need to do something about the lives of boys and men of color. And the CEOs came together and created their own organization to do this. They have a website, you can look it up, it's all good. Uh, the Executives Alliance just launched its very first campaign. And this campaign was called uh, Ban the Box. Hashtag Ban the Box, okay? And the idea behind this was that there is a box on job applications that say if you've been convicted or arrested of a crime or a felony or something like that, check this box. This box is a screening tool that keeps people from even being interviewed for a job. Even being interviewed. You can come in, you can put on your nice suit, you can walk in the door, you can smile, you can fill out the application, you check that box, more than likely, more than likely, your application goes into the round file, okay? And you don't get called back, right? So, the campaign started, and like any smart organization, we went back and examined our own practices. And Dr. Leviso Mori said, Dwayne, uh, make certain that, um, that, we're, that we're, we're okay on this issue. And I did, I checked. I checked with a, a variety of people at the foundation. They say, don't you worry, we are in compliance with New Jersey state law. And New Jersey state law bans the box on its public applications. We are in compliance with the law. And I went back to my boss and I said, we're good. We're good. She went down to Human Resources. She got an application. She looked at it. The box was there. We were still in compliance with the law. The box was there. Mud on my face? Yes. That's my vulnerability. Okay. Um, we removed the box from the job applications. It's not there anymore. So if someone does come into the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and wants to apply for a job, that, that box will not keep them from getting a job interview anymore. It's gone. And to, thank you. And it's not easy to share uh, vulnerabilities, but if you're on this journey of health equity, you have to. And it can't always be done inside a closed room, right? So today, on the blackenterprise.com website, there is an editorial written by me and Dr. Laviso Mori talking about our journey with Ban the Box and encouraging others and corporations around the country to take a look at their job applications, to, to actually physically take a look at their job applications and see if that box exists. And, and if you want to make your place a more equitable place, then you will remove that box as well. That was our call, our call to action. It landed, I heard yesterday, it was gonna be on their website this morning, so it's there. So not only can I, I be vulnerable with you in this room, we want to make our vulnerabilities known because if the nation needs to take this journey, if the nation needs to start thinking about what it means to actually achieve health equity, then we can't, we can't, be, we can't be vulnerable in, in closed spaces. We actually have to say, this isn't as easy as it looks. This is a little difficult. And we have to examine all of our practices to know for sure. One more thing to tell you. In November or December of this year, the Institute of Medicine will release a report called Community-Based Solutions for Achieving Health Equity. This is supposed to be a big deal. For those of you who uh, represent the nursing field here, when the Future of Nursing report um, came out um, on the IOM website, it crashed the website. 
Okay, they had people, it was in such big demand because of the work that was inside that document, was in such big demand that it crashed the website the next day, IOM, I don't know what they did, got a couple more servers, whatever they do down in DC when these things happen, um, whatever they do. Um, so we want the same thing to happen. So uh, pay attention to what's going on with the National Academy of Medicine. Their hashtag that they use is called Promote Health Equity. They are going around the country now in different communities hearing what things have been done to achieve health equity in, in those communities. Those lessons will be uh, compiled into this document. They will be, if, if all goes according to plan, we never know, but if they all go according to plan, they, uh, the lessons that are learned will be in chapters that are headed by each of the social determinants of health. So that if you're in the field of education, you'll know about community-based solutions there. If you're, in, if you're in areas of housing or public safety or access to quality care, you'll know about what has been going on around the country. And then I would always never advise just adopting and doing the things that need to be done, thinking about how it fits within your own culture and your own community. Um, uh, to see how it fits. Last thing I will say is I absolutely admire what you're trying to do. I admire the leadership here that's pulled you all together. I, I want to reiterate the call that I heard first thing this morning was that this meeting was not just about today, not just about um, today, not just about today. You said you want to action plans, okay? Action plans, that's why we have an action framework because it's not about just discussion. We really do need to have this culture of health in America. We need Detroit to be healthy. We need every place in the country to be healthy. And I'm just so honored that you would invite me to be here today. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, sure. We've um, we've done a few we've done a few things, and like I said, it has been easy because some of these discussions are very uh, heartfelt. They pull on people's strings. They they challenge our mentality. Um, we we use a, um, a web platform inside our foundation called Chatter. Okay, and so others may have similar uh, types of things, and we have this hashtag we call hashtag the talk. Okay, um, because we know that it's just not one discussion that will get us there. Um, and so we use that as a way of communicating. How do you tell stories about people without exploiting them? You know, as was a conversation that came up within the foundation. How do you, um, how do you, how, how do I, as the person who I am, talk about these things that have affected other people and still sound credible in the work? Um, and I would think that in the medical professions, the, um, you know, it's uh, science rules, okay? Um, and, and helping to define terms is very, very important. So when we're talking about racism, what type of racism are we talking about in particular? Because when you hear the word racism, I don't know what pictures come to mind, okay? Um, and maybe it is uh, actually interpersonal bigotry that you're talking about, not racism. Maybe it's racially bigoted attitudes, but not structural racism, not institutional racism. And last night I heard a, a term and a phrase, because I pay attention, right? Spatial racism, okay? Uh, as, a, as a way of understanding uh, residential segregation in a different way. So being very clear about the terms that you're using, I think will be very helpful. Um, I would hope that with medical students also uh, using science, okay? Go back to that genome project. Go back to that genome project that says that uh, only 1% of our differences can be attributed to the phenotype that we usually associate with race, and that 99% of, of who we are, we are, are, are the same. And then getting into this idea of a social construct of race, okay? The social construct of race, race being made up like the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. Um, yeah. Devastating. Devastating to find that out as a kid, you know, that your parents have been deceiving you a little bit. Um, and, but also that society has also been deceiving you a little bit. The society has also made you understand that there are differences between us that are uh, in inherent, that, uh, that there are superior and inferior races, okay? And so bringing the science into it, but being clear about the, um, the constructs that you're talking about, and if you're not clear about the constructs that you're talking about, seek clarity, okay? And if you're in a room like this and somebody just throws out a term like racism, challenge them, what exactly do you mean? 
because everybody in this room may have a different thought when you just use a blanket term about something that's been so heavily embedded in our nation. Thank you, Teresa. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Cleo Caldwell from the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are many components to it, mm -hmm. and they're going to be successful when you're trying to get started with this type of framework. Mm -hmm. How do you get some advice on how you need to actually start doing this? No, thank you for that. Um, and what, what we've seen, and this is new for us, by the way, um, what we've seen is that page 41 seems to be the most important page in the Action Framework document. Okay? Page 41. 41. Page 41 has a list of all the measures that we're using to see how the country is progressing towards a culture of health. And then uh, what I've seen communities do is pick out the measures that are most important for them and say this is how we're going to focus our efforts and here are the things that we want to see change. The measures that are in the um, action framework are not the typical clinical um, measures of looking at differences in life expectancy, infant mortality, uh, prevalence of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and others. It is what proportion of our community um, is registered to vote and actually vote, okay? Because that can help to lead to change. Um, how, how many of our young people, our youngest people, are able to take advantage of pre-K education. If the number's low, we need to see that, that come up. Uh, these, are, these are the types of measures that you can, you can see in your everyday, in your, in your everyday. What are the relationships between um, police and the community? Are there citizen review boards uh, to take a look at police actions when police actions occur? Those will be the signs of a healthy community. And so, I, so what I've seen is that communities quickly flip through till they get to page 41, and then they say, okay, here's a few things that we can wrap our, wrap our minds around because these are the things that affect our community, and I'll go further from there. Thank you for your question. Thank you.